Rebecca was a, a best-selling novel before it made its great screen success. And tonight, it's brought to you by one of America's best-selling products, Lux Flakes. And it's you, the women of America, who've made it a best-selling product. We want you to use our product week in and week out, not just because you like the plays in the Lux Radio Theater, but because Lux Flakes stands on its own merits. Take our word that it's worth a trial, and we'll take your word on the result. And we don't need three guesses what it's going to be. Now the curtain rises on a great love story, the strange drama of Rebecca. The scene of this drama is Mandalay, the great stone manor house high on a cliff above the restless sea. You'll hear Ronald Coleman as Maxim de Winter, Judith Anderson as Mrs. Danvers, and Ida Lupino as the woman whose name we do not know. Last night, I dreamt I went to Mandalay again. It seemed to me I stood by the iron gate leading to the drive. But for a while, I could not enter, for the way was barred to me. Then, like all dreamers, I was possessed of a sudden with supernatural powers and passed like a spirit through the barrier before me. The drive wound away in front of me, twisting and turning, and finally, there was Mandalay. Mandalay, secretive and silent. Time could not mar the perfect symmetry of those walls, but I knew I looked upon a desolate, empty shell. We can never go back to Mandalay again. That much is certain. But sometimes, in my dreams, I do go back to the strange days of my life which began for me in the south of France. There, on a great cliff, towering above the sea, I first saw him. He was looking down, staring at the rocks below. And then suddenly, I thought I saw him. No! No, no, stop! Stop! What the devil are you shouting about? Who are you? What are you staring at? Oh, I, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to stare, but you were so close to the edge of the cliff. I was afraid oh, that... Oh, you were. Well, what are you doing here? Well, I I was only walking. I came up the path well, and... Well, get on with your walking. Don't hang about here screaming. Go on. I shall never come to Monte Carlo out of season again. Not a single well-known personality in the hotel. Oh, this coffee is stone cold. Waiter, garçon. I, I don't believe he heard you, Mrs. Van Hoffer. Well, get him, get him. What are you being paid for, girl? You, uh, why, it's Max de Winter. See him coming this way. Oh. What are you looking surprised about? Why, I, I saw him today on the cliff path. Uh, Mr. de Winter, how do you do? How do you do? I'm Edith Van Hopper. Do you remember me? Oh, it's so yes. nice to run into you here. Do sit down and have some coffee. Mr. De Winter is having coffee with me. You may go. Of course, Mrs. Van Hoppen. I'm afraid I must contradict you. You shall both have coffee with me. Garçon, coffee, please. Oui, monsieur. You know, I recognized you just as soon as you came in. Are you playing the tables much here at Monte? No, I'm afraid that sort of thing ceased to amuse me years ago. Oh, I can well understand that. If I had a home like Manderley, I should certainly never come to Monte. I hear it's one of the biggest places in that part of the country, and that you just can't beat it for beauty. And what do you think of Monte Carlo? Or don't you think of it at all? Well, I... I think it's rather artificial. She's spoiled, Mr. De Winter. That's her trouble. Most girls would give their eyes for a chance to see Monte. Wouldn't that rather defeat the purpose? But now that we've found each other again, I hope I shall be seeing something of you. Your valet has unpacked for you, I suppose. Huh. I'm afraid I don't possess one. Perhaps you'd like to do it for me. Uh, well, um, this young lady might make herself useful. She's a capable child in many ways, aren't you, dear? Oh, Mrs. Van Hopp. That's a charming suggestion, but I'm afraid I'd cling to the old motto, he travels fastest who travels alone. Uh, perhaps you've not heard of it. Good night. Well, what do you make of that? Do you suppose that sudden departure was intended to be funny? Or oh, perhaps he didn't quite realize how it looked. Poor thing. I suppose he just can't get over his wife's death. They say he simply adored her. When I came alone to the dining room the following day, he was already there, 
at the next table. As I sat down, I paid the penalty of my awkwardness. I knocked over a vase of flowers, the water soaking the cloth. Mademoiselle. Oh, I, I, I'm so sorry. What a stupid thing to do. You may leave that, waiter. Go and lay another place at my table. Mademoiselle will have lunch with me. Oui, monsieur. Oh, no, I, I couldn't possibly. Uh, why not? Oh, please, don't be polite. It's very kind of you, I but... wasn't being polite. I should have asked you to lunch with me, even if you hadn't been so clumsy. Sit down. We needn't talk to each other if we don't feel like it. Well, thank you very much. What's happened to your friend? Why, she's ill in bed with a cold. Ah. I'm sorry I was rude to you yesterday. The only excuse I can offer is that I've become boorish through living alone. Oh, but you weren't really. You... Why, you just wanted to be by yourself. Tell me, is, um, is Mrs. Van Hopper a friend of yours or just a relation? No, she's my employer. I'm what is known as a paid companion. I didn't know that companionship could be bought. Is that a sketching pad? Do you sketch? Yes, I, I do a little. Were you going sketching this afternoon? Yes. Where? Well, I, I hadn't made up my mind. I... Oh, I'll drive you somewhere in the car. Oh, no. No, please. I, I didn't nonsense, mean that. Nonsense, nonsense. Order your lunch and we'll get along. Well, you've taken long enough with that sketch. I'll expect a really fine work of art. <laughs> well, you're not a very easy subject. Your expression keeps changing all the time. Does it? Well, I'd concentrate on the view instead if I were you. It's much more worthwhile. Rather reminds me of our coastline at home. Do you know Cornwall at all? Oh, yes. Yes, I, I went there once on a holiday. I remember. I was in a shop there, and I saw a postcard with a beautiful house on it right by the sea. I asked whose house it was, and the old lady said, Why, that's Manderley. Yes, Manderley is beautiful, but to me it's just the place where I was born and have lived in all my life. Now I don't suppose I shall ever see it again. Oh, well, we're lucky not to be home during the bad weather, aren't we? You know, I can't ever remember enjoying swimming at home until June, can you? But the water's so warm here, I could stay in all day. But do you know there's a dangerous undertow, and there was a man drowned here last year? But I never have any fear of drowning, have you? Why did you say that? But have I said something wrong? Oh, I didn't mean to. Oh, well, come along, I'll take you home. That night, I learned the reason for his strangeness. Coming home late, I opened the door. I heard Mrs. Van Hopper talking to the nurse. Oh, yes, I knew him quite well. I knew his wife, too. She was the beautiful Rebecca Hildreth, you know, the most glamorous creature in all England. She was drowned, poor thing, while she was sailing near Manderley. Oh, I'm glad it can't happen twice. That fever of first love. I've forgotten much of Monte Carlo, of those morning drives with him, of where we went and of what we said. But I've not forgotten how I trembled as I sat beside him. You know, I do wish there could be an invention that bottled up the memory like perfume. And then whenever I wanted to, I could just uncork the bottle and live the memory all over again. And what particular moment in your young life would you want to keep? Oh, all of them. All of these last few days. Sometimes, you know, those little bottles contain demons that have a way of popping out at you, just as you're trying most desperately to forget. Yes, of course. And stop biting your nails. Oh, I didn't know I was. Mr. De Winter... Would you please tell me why you asked me to come out with you? Oh, it's obvious that you want to be kind, but why do you choose me for your charity? I asked you to come out with me because I wanted your company. You've blotted out the past for me more than all the bright lights of Monte Carlo. But if you think I asked you out of kindness or charity, you can leave the car now and find your own way home. Go on, open the door and get out. Here, take my handkerchief. You'd better blow your nose. Thank you, Mr. DeWinter. And... Please, don't call me Mr. De Winter. I have a very impressive array of first names. George, Fortescue, Maximilian. 
but you needn't bother with them all at once. My family call me Maxim. Come in. Well, hello. Well, what are you doing here? Anything the matter? I've, I've come to say goodbye, Maxim. We're going away. Oh, where's she taking you to? New York. Oh, I don't want to go. I shall hate it. I shall be miserable. Do you mind if I finish shaving? I shan't be long. But I can't stay. I... Tell me something. Which would you prefer, New York or Mandalay? Oh, please don't joke about it. Mrs. Van Hopper's waiting. So I... I'd better say goodbye now. I'll repeat what I said. Either you go to America with Mrs. Van Hopper... or you come home to Mandalay with me. You mean you... you want a secretary or something? I'm asking you to marry me, you little fool. Marry you? Well, my suggestion doesn't seem to have gone at all well. I'm sorry. Oh, but you, you don't understand. It's... it's that I... well, I'm, I'm just not the sort of person men marry. Well, what on earth do you mean? Well, I don't belong in your sort of world, for one thing. <laughs> what is my sort of world? Well, Mandalay. Oh, you know what I mean. Well, I'm the best judge of whether you belong there or not. Of course, if you don't love me, that's a different thing. A fine blow to my conceit, that's all. Oh, but I do love you. I love you most dreadfully. I've been crying all morning because I thought I'd never see you again. Bless you for that. I'll remind you of this one day, and you won't believe me. It's a pity you have to grow up. I was afraid to tell Mrs. Van Hopper, for I knew what she would say. When we were alone, she congratulated me. But I didn't like her smile. But of course you know why he's marrying you, don't you? The fact is that empty house got on his nerves. He just couldn't go on living alone. You haven't flattered yourself that he's in love with you, I hope. Not after being married to Rebecca Hildreth, the most beautiful, the most cultured woman in all England. Well, goodbye and good luck, Mrs. De Winter. We were married that evening in a little village near the sea. And in early May, we came to Mandalay. It was raining as we drove through the high iron gates. The drive twisted and turned as a serpent. And then suddenly, there was the house. Mandalay. A thing of grace and beauty. And yet somehow almost frightening. As we came into the great hall, I saw that it was crowded with people. The staff of the house and the estate. They stood silent and curious, gazing at me. And then someone advanced from the sea of faces. She was tall and gaunt, dressed in deep black. And her prominent cheekbones and hollow eyes gave her a sort of skull's face. And this is Mrs. Danvers. You won't have to worry about the house at all, darling. Mrs. Danvers takes care of everything. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Danvers. Good evening, madam. I have everything in readiness for you. Well, that, that's so good of you. Will you go to your room now, madam, or will you have tea in the library? Why, I... I don't think The room I... first, Mrs. Danvers. Yes, sir. This way, if you please, madam. I hope you approve the new decorations of these rooms, madam. Oh, I didn't know it had been changed. What did it look like before, Mrs. Danvers? It had an old paper and different hangings. It was never used much, except for occasional visitors. Oh, then it wasn't Mr. De Winter's room originally. No, madam. He has never used the east wing before. The only good view of the sea is from the west wing. Mrs. Danvers, I, I suppose you've been at Manderley for many years. I came here when the first Mrs. De Winter was a bride. Oh, I do hope we'll be friends, Mrs. Danvers. <laughs> but you must be patient with me. You see, this sort of life is... Well, it's so new to me. And I do want to make a success of it and make Mr. De Winter happy. So I know I can leave all the household arrangements to you. I hope I shall do everything to your satisfaction, madam. I have managed the house since Mrs. De Winter's death, and Mr. De Winter has never complained. Well, I... I think I'll go downstairs now. Certainly, madam. 
The room in the west wing I was telling you about is there, through that door. It's not used now. It's the most beautiful room in the house. The only one that looks down across the lawns to the sea. It was Mrs. De Winter's room. I knew that night that Mrs. Danvers despised me. Standing there, watching me, laughing silently at my awkwardness, telling me over and over that there'd been another before me, the beautiful Rebecca Hildreth. There was everything to remind me of that. The embroidered letter R on the linens, her writing paper in the drawers of the desk, her dog who still slept outside her room. She was everywhere at Mandalay. Rebecca, who had died, and who still wandered through that house. Oh, good morning. Oh, good morning. You're Mrs. De Winter, aren't you? Why, uh, yes. My name's Crawley. I manage the estate for Maxie. Awfully glad to meet you. Uh, how do you do? Feel a lot of stuff piled up while Maxim was away? Uh, yes, I, I'm sure there must have been. Oh, I, I do wish I could help with some of it. Help him? Frank never allows anybody to help him. He's like an old mother hen with his bills and rents and taxes. Come on, Frank, we must go over those estimates. I'll get my papers. Later on this afternoon, we'll take a walk around the estate, darling, just you and I. There's a good deal I want you to see. I'll be ready, Max, at any time. Come along, Jasper, come along. Keep that coat up around you, darling. Oh, it isn't raining now, Max, and must I? Certainly. <laughs> Can't be too careful with children, you know. Oh. Glorious here. I love every foot of it, Maxim. Jasper, here, not that way. Jasper, come back. Oh, he went down those stairs by the cliff, Maxim. Where does that lead to? Oh, it leads to a little cove where we used to keep a boat. Oh, let's go down there. No, it, it's only a dull and uninteresting stretch of sand, just like any other. Oh, please, Maxim. No, some other time, dear, not today. Well, listen, is that Jasper? Well, there must be something wrong. Perhaps he's hurt himself. Oh, he's all right. Leave him alone. Oh, I think I'd better go and see. No, come back. Don't bother about him. He can't come to any harm. He'll find his own way back. Jasper! 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 Oh, there you are. What do you want in that cottage, Jasper? Come on home. Come on, boy. Come on, Jasper. Oh. Oh, I, I didn't know there was anybody. Oh, no, that doggy comes from the house. He aren't your own. No. No, he's Mr. De Winter's dog. Oh, no, that dog. He comes down looking for her. Who? Whose cottage is this? Mrs. De Winter. Oh. Come here, Jasper. You won't tell anyone you saw me in here, will you? Don't you belong on the estate? Oh, yes, but I won't do nothing. I was just putting my shells away. She's gone in the sea, ain't she? She'll never come back no more. No. No, she'll never come back. Come on, Jasper. Come on, boy. Maxim! Maxim, here I am. Wait, Maxim. Oh, I'm so sorry I was such a time. You knew I didn't want you to go there, but you deliberately went. Oh, why not, Maxim? There was only a cottage down there and a strange man well, who Well, was... don't go there again. Do you hear? Why not, Maxim? Because I hate the place. And if you had my memories, you wouldn't go there or talk about it or even think about it. What's the matter? Oh, I'm so sorry. Maxim... We should have stayed away. We should never have come back to Manderley. What a fool I was. I've made you unhappy. Somehow I've hurt you. I can't bear to see you like this, Maxim, because I love you so much. But do you? Do you? Oh, I've made you cry. Forgive me. I sometimes seem to fly off the handle for no reason at all, don't I? Come. We'll go home and have some tea and forget all about it. Yes. Yes, let's forget all about it. So ends Act One of Rebecca.
starring Ronald Coleman, Ida Lupino, and Judith Anderson. Mr. DeMille brings you Act Two in just a moment. But now, a word about what women are telling us is the biggest bargain they've seen in a long time. The beautiful Gone with the Wind brooch, which the makers of Lux Flakes are now offering. That's just what Mrs. Janet Bell of New York says, Mr. Ruick. She got her brooch the other day and wrote us a letter saying, My Gone with the Wind brooch is so much lovelier even than I had thought it would be. And such a wonderful bargain that I want to thank you for it and to let you know how pleased I am with it. Thanks again for my lovely brooch and for such a wonderful product as Lux Flakes. We know every one of you will feel just as delighted as Mrs. Bell when you see this stunning Gone with the Wind brooch. And in a moment, I'll tell you how easy it is to get it. The original was one of the gorgeous jewelry pieces worn in the movie Gone with the Wind. Our reproduction is a distinctive and expensive-looking pin with five simulated pearls and a lovely turquoise-colored stone in the center of an antique-style, gold-finished setting. It's big, round, and almost two inches across with a graceful scalloped edge and a sturdy safety catch on the clasp. You'll find it adds a handsome touch to your new spring prints and to daytime and party dresses, too. Now listen carefully. Here's what you do to get your Gone with the Wind brooch. First, buy a big box of Lux Flakes. You'll want plenty of new quick Lux on hand anyway for all your nice things, for stockings, underthings, sweaters, washable dresses, and for dishwashing, too. Then... Tear off the opening tab at the top corner of the Lux box. Mail it with 15 cents in coin. Please don't send stamps. To Lux, Box 1, New York City. Lux, Box 1, New York City. And don't forget, we can't send you a brooch unless you send us your name and address. With your brooch, you'll receive an illustrated order blank for matching jewelry pieces. Ring, pendant, bracelet, earrings and all wonderful bargains. Now be sure to send your order in soon, for these pins are going like hotcakes, and the offer is limited. We're sorry, but this offer is good only in the United States. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. We begin the second act of our play, starring Ronald Coleman as Maxim De Winter, Judith Anderson as Mrs. Danvers, and Ida Lupino as the woman who is now Mrs. De Winter, the woman who is telling this story of Rebecca. The weather was wet and cold for almost a week. And we didn't go down to the beach again. But I couldn't forget the dark, lost look in Maxim's eyes when we came up the path through the woods. It was my fault. I'd gone down to that cottage. I seemed to have opened up a road into the past. And there was a barrier between us because of it. I began to dread any mention of the sea. Until one morning in the library... I was alone with Frank Crawley. Mr. Crawley, I... I was down at the cottage on the beach the other day. Are those all Rebecca's things down there? Uh, Yes, uh, yes, they are. Oh. What did she use the cottage for? The boat used to be moored near there. The boat? Was that the boat she was sailing in when she was drowned? Yes, it capsized and sank. She was washed overboard. Where did they find her? They reached them about 40 miles up channel, about two months afterwards. Maxim went up to identify her. Oh, it was horrible for him. Yes. Yes, it must have been. Mr. Crawley, please don't think me morbidly curious. But would you answer just one more question? If it's something I'm able to answer. Tell me, what was Rebecca really like? I suppose she was the most beautiful creature I ever saw. Maxim had to go up to London at the end of June. Some business of the estate. Frank Crawley had gone along with him. And I was alone at Manderley. I was surprised one evening to hear voices coming from the West Wing. From the room that was once Rebecca's. I really don't think it was wise of you to come here, Mr. Jack. Oh, nonsense, nonsense. It's been just like coming back home. But I must say I feel a little like the poor relations sneaking around through back doors... Well, toodaloo, Danny. Goodbye, Mr. Jack. And please be careful. I will. Don't worry. Oh, hello. Good evening. 
Danny, all your precautions were in vain. The mistress of the house was hiding behind the door. Oh, but I, I wasn't really. I wasn't. I heard voices in here. What about presenting me to the bride, Danny? This is Mr. Favell, madam. How do you do? How do you do? Will you have some tea or something? Now, isn't that a charming invitation? I've been asked to stay to tea, Danny. It's rather late. Oh, well, perhaps you're right. And we mustn't lead the bride astray, must we? Well, goodbye. Oh, and I know what was wrong with our introduction. Danny didn't tell you, did she? I'm Rebecca's favorite cousin. Toodaloo. The man went quickly down the stairs, and Mrs. Danvers went after him. All of a sudden, I had a terrifying impulse to see what lay behind the door in front of me. The door of Rebecca's room. I pushed it open slowly. I could hear the sea plainly through the window. I'd expected to see the furniture swathed in dust sheets. Nothing was covered up. There were flowers on the dressing table. A satin dressing gown on the chair. And beneath, a pair of bedroom slippers. <gasps> oh! Do you wish anything, madam? No. No, no, I... I... Just... You've always wanted to see this room, haven't you, madam? Why did you never ask me to show it to you? It's a lovely room, isn't it? The most beautiful room you've ever seen. Everything is kept just as Mrs. De Winter liked it. Nothing has been altered since that last night. You wouldn't think she'd been gone so long, would you? Sometimes, when I walk along the corridor... I fancy I hear her just behind me, that quick, light step. I couldn't mistake it anywhere. It's not only in this room. It's in all the rooms in the house. I can almost hear it now. Do you believe the dead to come back and watch the living? No. No. I don't believe it. Sometimes. I wonder if she doesn't come back here to Mandalay... And watch you and Mr. De Winter together. <sighs> you look tired. Why don't you stay here a while and rest? Listen to the sea. It's so soothing. No. No. No, I... Listen to it. Listen to the sea. I won't listen. I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. Maxim, I'm so glad you're home again. Hey, hey, you're choking me. <laughs> well, well, what, what have you been doing with yourself? Well, I, I've been thinking. Darling, could we have a costume ball just as you used to? What, what put that idea into your mind? Oh, nothing. I just feel that we ought to do something to make people feel that Mandalay is the same as it always was. Oh, please, darling, could we? Well, all right. If you think you'd enjoy it, you'd better get Mrs. Danvers to help you, hadn't you? No. No, I don't need Mrs. Danvers to help me. I can do it myself, Maxim. <laughs> All right, my sweet. But Mrs. Danvers did help me. It was she who suggested that I design my costume after one of the family portraits in the gallery. A lovely young woman in a white dress with great puffed sleeves. When the night of the party arrived, I could hardly contain myself for excitement for I'd kept the costume as a surprise for Maxim. I ran quickly down the stairs, and then I waited for the clapping and the laughter that would greet me. But nobody clapped. Nobody moved. And then Maxim was coming toward me, his face white, his eyes blazing. What the devil do you think you're doing? Maxim, it's the picture, the one in the gallery. What have I done? Go and take it off. Doesn't matter what you put on, anything will do. What are you standing there for? Didn't you hear what I said? Take it off! I watched you go down the stairs, just as I watched her a year ago. Even in the same dress, you couldn't compare with her. The same dress? You knew it. You knew that she wore it. And yet you deliberately suggested I wear it. Why do you hate me? What have I done to you that you should hate me so? You tried to take her place. You let him marry you. 
I've seen his face, his eyes. They're the same as those first weeks after she died. I used to listen to him walking up and down, up and down all night long, night after night, thinking of her suffering torture because he'd lost her. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. You thought you could be Mrs. De Winter, live in her house, walk in her steps, take the things that were hers, but she's too strong for you. You can't fight her. No one ever got the better of her, never, never. She was beaten in the end, but it wasn't a man, it wasn't a woman. It was the sea. Stop it! Stop it! Oh, stop it! You're overwrought, madam. I'll open a window for you. A little air will do you good. Come and stand here, madam. Don't be afraid. Now look down there. Isn't the sea lovely? Why don't you go? Why don't you leave Manderley? He doesn't need you. He's got his memories. You've nothing to stay for. You've nothing to live for, really, have you? Look down there. It's easy, isn't it? Why don't you? Why don't you? Go on. Don't be afraid. Why don't you jump? Ah! What is it? What's that noise? Maxim! Maxim, where are you? Maxim! What is it? What is it? What's happened? Shipwreck. There's a ship at ground sending up rockets. Robbie, notify the Coast Guard. Shipwreck. seen Maxim on the beach? Not since half an hour ago. He hasn't been in the house all night. I'm afraid something might have happened to him. Frank, what's the matter? You look terribly worried. Well, the, the diver who went down to inspect the bottom of the ship came across the hull of another boat, a, a little sailboat. Oh, Frank, is it? Yes, it's Rebecca's. Rebecca's? Oh, why did they have to find it? Why couldn't they have left it there in peace at the bottom of the sea? Poor Maxim. It'll be so hard on him. Yes, it's going to bring it all back again, and worse than before. I searched the beach frantically for Maxim. But there was no sign of him. And suddenly I came upon the boathouse, Rebecca's cottage. There was a light burning dimly in the window. I pushed open the door... And there, in the light of the dying fire, I saw the tortured face of Maxim. Hello. Come in. Maxim, you haven't had any sleep. Have you forgiven me? Forgiven you? For last night, Maxim. My stupidity about the costume. Oh, that. I'd forgotten. Oh, Maxim, can't we start all over again? I don't ask that you should love me. I won't ask impossible things. I I'll be your friend and companion. I'll be happy with that. You love me very much, don't you? But it's too late, my darling. We've lost our little chance of happiness. No, Maxim, no. It's all over now. Rebecca has won. Her shadow has been between us all the time, keeping us from one another. She knew that this would happen. What are you saying, Maxim? They sent a diver down. He found another boat. I know. Rebecca's boat. The diver made another discovery. He broke one of the ports and looked into the cabin. There was a body in there. A body? Well, then she wasn't alone. There was someone sailing with her. No, you don't understand. There was no one with her. It's Rebecca's body lying there on the cabin floor. Oh, no. No. The woman that was washed up at Edgecombe, the woman that is now buried in the family crypt... That was not Rebecca. That was the body of some unknown woman, unclaimed, belonging nowhere. I identified it, but I knew it wasn't Rebecca. I knew where Rebecca's body was, lying on that cabin floor on the bottom of the sea. How did you know, Maxim? Because I put it there. You? You? Will you look into my eyes and tell me that you love me now? Oh, Max. You see, I was right. 
It's too late. No. No, it's not too late, Maxim. You're not to say that. We can't lose each other now. We must be together always. We may only have a few hours, a few days. Oh, Maxim, why didn't you tell me before? Sometimes I nearly did, but you never seemed close enough. How could we be close when I knew you were always thinking of Rebecca? How could I even ask you to love me when I knew you loved Rebecca still? What are you talking about? You thought I loved Rebecca? I hated her. Hated her? I was carried away by her, yes, enchanted by her as everyone was. But I never had a moment's happiness with her. She was incapable of love or tenderness or decency. You didn't love her. Do you remember that cliff where you first saw me in Monte Carlo? Well, I went there with Rebecca on our honeymoon. That was what I found out about her. Only four days after we were married. She stood there laughing, her black hair blowing in the wind, and told me all about herself. Things I'll never tell a living soul. I wanted to kill her. I'll make a bargain with you, she said. You'd look rather foolish trying to divorce me now after four days of marriage, so I'll play the part of a devoted wife, mistress of Manderley. And people will visit us and envy us and say we're the luckiest, happiest couple in the county. What a grand joke it will be. What a triumph. I should never have accepted her dirty bargain, but I did, and I kept it. So did she, apparently. But after a while, she began to grow careless. Then she started to bring her friends down here. I warned her, but she only shrugged her shoulders. And then there was a cousin of hers, a man named Favell. Yes, I know him. You? Yes, he came the day you went to London. Why didn't you tell me? Well, I, I didn't like to, Maxim. I thought it would remind you of Rebecca. Remind me? As if I needed reminding. Favell used to visit her here in this cottage. I found out about it and I warned her that if he came here again, I'd shoot them both. One night, when I found that she'd come back quietly from London, I thought that Favell was with her. I decided to come down here and have it out with both of them. But she was alone. She was lying on the divan. She looked ill, queer. Suddenly, she got up, started to walk toward me. When I have a child, she said, neither you nor anyone else can ever prove it wasn't yours. You'd like to have an heir, wouldn't you, Max, for your precious Manderley? And then she started to laugh. How funny, she said. I'll be the perfect mother, just as I've been the perfect wife, and no one will ever know. She was face to face with me. She was smiling. Well, Max, what are you going to do about it? Aren't you going to kill me? Well, I suppose I went mad for a moment. I must have... I must have struck her. She stood staring at me. She looked almost triumphant. And then she started forward toward me again, smiling. Suddenly she stumbled and fell. And I looked down. Ages afterwards, it seemed, she was lying on the floor. She'd struck her head on a heavy piece of ship's tackle. I remember wondering why she was still smiling. And then I realized she was dead. But you didn't kill her, Maxim. It was an accident. Who would believe me? I lost my head. I, I knew I had to do something, anything. I carried her out to the boat. I put her in the cabin. When the boat seemed a safe distance from the shore, I took a spike and drove it again and again through the planking of the hull. I opened up the seacocks and the water began to come in fast. I climbed over into the dinghy and pulled away. Then I saw the boat heel over and sink. Maxim, does anyone else know of this? No, no one except you and me. We must explain it. It's got to be the body of someone you've never seen before. No, they're bound to know her. Her rings and bracelets, she always wore them. They'll identify her body. Then they'll remember the other woman. The other woman buried in the crypt. Oh, Maxim. I've done a very selfish thing in marrying you. I've loved you, my darling. I shall always love you. But I've known all along that Rebecca would win in the end. No. No, she hasn't won. No matter what happens now, she hasn't won. Hello. Oh, hello, Frank. Who? Colonel Julian? Yes. Yes, tell him I'll meet him there as soon as I possibly can. What's happened, Maxim? Colonel Julian called. He's the chief constable of the county. He wants to know if I could possibly have made a mistake about that other body. Mr. DeMille presents Ronald Coleman, Ida Lupino, and Judith Anderson in Act Three of Rebecca after a brief intermission. Meanwhile, it's breakfast time in the Browning household, 
And Midge is late, as usual. Midge, hurry, dear. The postman left a package for you, and it's nearly school time. Oh, where is it? It must be my brooch. Oh, it is. Oh, Mother, isn't it gorgeous? Now, I won't mind wearing my old dress to Betty's party with this on it. Why, it's perfectly beautiful, dear. You know, it looks like some of that lovely old jewelry from Grandmother's family down in Charleston. You'll agree with Mother Browning when you get this Gone With Wind brooch which Lux is offering. For it has an authentic southern accent. The original was worn in Gone With The Wind. Now, it's entirely different from the Scarlet O'Hara brooch we offered last fall, and even lovelier. You'll wear it to add new glamour to a dress you've grown a bit bored with. And it will be smart with your new spring outfits, too. Let me describe it for you. In the center is a big turquoise-colored stone with five lovely simulated pearls around it. The setting is round, almost two inches wide, and gold-finished in antique style with a scalloped edge. It's beautifully made. Even has a safety catch on the clasp. Yet it's yours for only 15 cents and an opening tab from a large box of Lux Flakes. Now, here's the way to get your Gone with the Wind brooch. Please listen carefully to these directions. And above all, please send for your brooch without delay, because the orders are pouring in, and the offer is for a limited time. Now, first, buy a big box of new Quick Lux Flakes. It comes in the same familiar package and costs you no more. Tear off the opening tab at the top corner of the Lux box and mail it with 15 cents in coin, no stamps, please, and your name and address to Lux, Box 1, New York City. Lux, Box 1, New York City. With your brooch, we'll send an illustrated order blank for additional matching pieces. Ring, pendant, bracelet, earrings, and all wonderful bargains. Now remember, send the opening tab from a large box of Lux Flakes, 15 cents in coin, and your name and address to Lux, Box 1, New York. This offer is good only in the United States. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. curtain rises on the third act of Rebecca and the girl whom Maxim de Winter brought home as a bride to the brooding towers of Mandalay goes on with her strange story. The body they had found in the boat was identified as Rebecca de Winter. There had to be an inquest, of course. Maxim was calm almost too calm. I think that frightened me even more. Sorry to drag you back for further questioning, Mr. De Winter. You've heard the statement of the boat builder, Mr. Tabb. I wonder if you can help us in any way. I'm afraid not. The holes in the planking were evidently made from the inside. Can you think of any reason for that? Of course I can't think of any reason. Then, since Mrs. De Winter went sailing alone, are we to believe that she drove those holes herself? You may believe what you like. Can you enlighten us as to why Mrs. De Winter should have wanted to end her own life? I know of no reason whatever. Mr. De Winter, however painful it may be, I have to ask you a very personal question. Uh, were relations between you and the late Mrs. De Winter perfectly happy? Once again, were relations I between you... I won't stand this any longer, and no, you might as well no, know that... Him, don't you, can't you? Mrs. De Winter. Oh, well, oh, we'll adjourn until after luncheon. Oh, darling, darling, are you all right? Frank, help me. I'll take her outside. Oh, Careful, darling. There's no rush. I'll take you to the car. Oh, Maxon... It was so foolish of me, fainting like that. Hello. Maxim, it's, it's that Favelle. And uh, how does the bride find herself today? What do you want, Favelle? How are you, Max? I was rather worried about you when I heard about the inquest. That's why I came down. Yes, I'm touched by your solicitude, but if you don't mind... Well, my guess is that they'll turn in a verdict of suicide. That is, of course, unless something unforeseen occurs. What do you mean? Well... I have a strong feeling that before the day is out, somebody's going to make use of that rather expressive, though somewhat old-fashioned term, foul play. Go on. You see, Max, 
I find myself in a rather awkward position. You've only got to read this note to understand. It's from Rebecca. She wrote it to me the day she died. What makes you think that note would interest me? Oh, I'm not going to bother you with the contents now, but I can assure you that it's not the note of a woman who intends to drown herself that same night. You know, Max, I've often wondered what it would be like to retire to the country. I've never, never figured out what it would cost a year, but I'd like to talk about it with you. Uh, darling, Mr. Favell and I have a little business transaction on hand. I think we'd better conduct it over at the inn. They may have a private room there. But, Maxim... Are you all right now, dear? Yes, I... Uh, Frank will be here in a moment. Ask him to find Colonel Julian. Then come over to the inn immediately. Come on, Favell, let's go. Julian, this is Mr. Favell. Oh, I know Colonel Julian. We're old friends, aren't we? Uh, good morning. Well, since you're old friends, I, sh I assume you also know that he's head of the police here. I think he might be interested to hear your proposition. I don't know what you mean. I only want to see justice done, Colonel. The evidence suggested certain possible theories concerning Rebecca's death. One of them, of course, is suicide. Now, I have a little note here which puts that possibility quite out of court. You read it, Colonel? Uh, yeah. Jack, darling, I've just seen the doctor and I'm going down to Manderley right away. I shall be at the cottage all this evening and shall leave the door open for you. I have something terribly important to tell you. Rebecca. Now, does that look like the note of a woman who'd made up her mind to kill herself? Come, Colonel, as an officer of the law, don't you feel that there are some slight grounds for suspicion? Of murder? Or what else? It's blackmail, pure and simple. Well, blackmail's not so pure nor so simple. Mr. Favell, perhaps you can provide us also with a motive. I knew you were going to bring that up, Colonel. Yes, I'll supply that too. Oh, Maxim, what is he going to do? Uh, will you come in, Mrs. Danvers? Thank you. Colonel Julian, Mrs. Danvers. I, uh, I believe you know everyone else, Danny. Uh, Mrs. Danvers, there are a few questions... Uh, no offense, I... Colonel, but I think if I put this to Danny, she'll understand it more easily. Danny... Who was Rebecca's doctor? Mrs. De Winter always had Dr. McLean from the village. Now, you heard. I said Rebecca's doctor in, in, in London. We know that Rebecca went to a doctor in London on the last day of her life. Who was it? I don't know. Oh, I understand, Danny. You're trying to defend her. But that's just what I'm doing. Mrs. Danvers, it has been suggested that Mrs. De Winter was deliberately murdered. Murdered? There you have it in a nutshell, Danny. But there's one more thing you'll want to know. The name of the murderer. George Fortescue Maximilian de Winter. Well, Danny? There was a doctor. Mrs. de Winter sometimes went to him privately. Well, what was his name? Dr. Baker, 165 Gold Hawk Road, Shepherd's Bush. There you are, Colonel. There's where you'll find your motive. He'll tell you why Rebecca went to him, to confirm the fact that she was going to have a child, a sweet, curly-headed little child. She told Max about it. So like the gentleman of the old school that he is, he killed her. Uh, Maxima. I'm afraid we shall have to question this Dr. Baker. I'm ready to leave now, if you wish. Oh, Maxim, let me go with you. Oh, please, darling. Wait for me at Manderley. I'll be back the first thing in the morning. You say you never had a patient by the name of Rebecca de Winter? Never. You're sure of that, Dr. Baker? <laughs> of course. Here are all the appointments for that day. Ross, Campbell, Steddall, Perino, Danvers, Matthews... Danny, Fred... what the... Did you read that name again? Did you say Danvers? Why, yes, I had a Mrs. Danvers for three o'clock. What did she look like? Can you remember? Oh, yes, I remember her quite well. She was a very beautiful woman. Tall, dark, exquisitely dressed. Rebecca! Uh, the lady must have used an assumed name, Doctor. Oh, is that so? This is a surprise. What was the matter with her? My dear sir, there are certain now, ethics... Well, uh, could you supply a reason, Dr. Baker, for Mrs. De Winter's suicide? For her murder, you mean. She's going to have a child, wasn't she? Come on out with it. No, she was not, Mr. Favell. But she was very seriously ill. She was not going to have a child? And that was what she thought, but my diagnosis was different. She wanted the truth, and I told her. She had only a few months to live. A few... a few months? Perhaps even less. There was nothing could be done, nothing that she could do except wait... Did she... did she say anything when you told her? Oh, she smiled in a queer sort of way. Oh, yes, I remember she said something that struck me as being very peculiar at the time. Um, when I told her it was a matter of months, she said, 
Oh, no, Doctor. Not that long. You've been very kind. Mm. You've told us all we wanted to know. I, uh, I should like to have a talk with you, Mr. Favell. Well, I, I didn't know that. I, I thought Will that... we be needed at the inquest any further, Colonel Julian? No, no, no. I can see to it that Maxim's not troubled any further. Thank you, sir. Frank. Yes? There's something you don't know. Oh, no, there isn't. There is. I didn't kill her, Frank. But I know now that when she told me about the child, she wanted me to kill her. She lied on purpose. She foresaw the whole thing. That's why she stood there laughing when she... Don't think about it anymore. What's the matter, Max? Why did you stop? What... What time is it? Oh, it must be three or four. Why? Well, look at the sky. Over that way. That can't be the dawn breaking. Mm, hardly. <laughs> Perhaps it's the northern lights. It's in the winter that you see them, isn't it? They aren't northern lights. That's Mandalay. It's burning. <laughs> Robert! Robert! Robert, have you seen Mrs. De Winter? Where is she? Maxim! Maxim, here. Darling. Oh, it's thank heaven you've come back to me. Are you... Are you all right? Yes, I'm all right, Maxim. But Mrs. Danvers, she's gone mad. She started the fire. She said she'd rather destroy Manderley than see us happy here. Yes, she is at that window. The West Wing. Oh, Maxim, she'll be killed. She'll... Ow! Last night... I dreamt I went to Manderley again. As I stood there, hushed and still, I could swear that the house was not an empty shell, but lived and breathed as it had long ago. But Manderley is no more, and we're happy now, Maxim and I, for all our fears and suffering lie buried in its ruins. Mr. DeMille and our stars will be back for their curtain calls in just a moment. But now Sally seems to have something on her mind. What is it, Sally? Mm, it's a riddle for you to answer, Mr. Ruick. Listen. What articles of feminine wearing apparel will have stretched end to end go around the world 25 times, and yet no woman thinks she ever has enough of them? Oh, I give up. Tell us, Sally. <laughs> Silk stockings, Mr. Ruick. In 1939, American women bought 682 million pairs of silk stockings. Stretched end to end, they would go 25 times around the world. Why, you take my breath away, Sally. And now, guess how long it takes to wash all those stockings. I don't need to guess that, Sally. I know that New Quick Lux is America's favorite stocking care. And for these speedy flakes, it takes only a few moments a day to give stockings safe care. That's right, because new Quick Lux flakes are so fast. In water as cool as your hand, they dissolve three times as fast as any of ten other leading soaps. And that saves time. And new Quick Lux is thrifty, because a little goes so far. That saves money. And it's so safe, so gentle. Yes. No wonder over 90% of the makers of women's stockings recommend Lux. It's so gentle, it saves stocking elasticity and cuts down on runs. Why not get that generous big box of Lux Flakes tomorrow for your stockings and other washables? You'll be delighted at how much longer they stay lovely with Lux Care. And the sooner you get the big Lux box, the sooner you can send for your beautiful Gone with the Wind brooch. Send the opening tab from the large box and 15 cents in coin to Lux, Box 1, New York City. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Ronald Coleman, Ida Lupino, and Judith Anderson are here at the microphone again. And with them, we have a special guest tonight, the producer of the motion picture Rebecca, Mr. David O. Selznick. Thank you, C.B. Purely as a member of the audience who enjoyed this radio play, I'd like to congratulate my old friend Ronald Coleman, Ida Lupino, and Judith Anderson on the fine performances they gave. 
David, we were all delighted you could be here tonight. I think it's wonderful when a producer spends his day off watching someone else produce. You seem to enjoy that part especially, Mr. Selznick. Well, I was as interested as though I'd never heard the story before. But then DeMille Productions have been moving and entertaining audiences ever since I can remember. <laughs> That's nice to hear, David, but don't go away. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I have an award to present to Mr. Selznick on behalf of the editors of Fame, representing 15,000 motion picture exhibitors and 80 million theater goers. The award covers 26 of your pictures, David. Pictures like A Tale of Two Cities, which starred Ronald Coleman a few years ago, David Copperfield, Rebecca, and Gone with the Wind, which captured 10 out of 14 Academy Awards last year and brought you personally the Irving Thalberg Memorial Trophy for maintaining the highest quality in production. The Fame Award reads, In token of his record as a producer of the greatest number of box office champion pictures over a period of nine years, denoting a special consistency of high competence in the art, Fame has the honor to present this document of commemoration to Mr. David Oliver Selznick, signed Martin Quigley, publisher of Fame. I'm very grateful to the editors of Fame, C.B., and for, for this distinction. And I'm doubly appreciative to have it presented by so great a showman as yourself. But this award should really have been made to three or four hundred of my associates, writers, directors like Victor Fleming of Gone with the Wind, and Alfred Hitchcock, who did such magnificent work on Rebecca, to cameramen and hundreds of other craftsmen, and naturally to talented players like Mr. Coleman and Mr. And Miss Anderson. That's very generous, David. Of course, you could cut that award up into 400 pieces, but I suppose it looks better as it is. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, Mr. Selznick, we forbid you to divide it up. You're all very kind. <laughs> and right now, C.B., I'd like to congratulate you and your staff on the result of the New York World Telegram's annual poll of the nation's radio editors. I've just learned that your program has been selected as radio's leading dramatic program for the seventh successive year. That's quite an honor, C.B. Hmm, it's more than that to us, David. It's something to live up to. Well, tell us, C.B., what you're going to do next, both on the screen and here in the Lux Radio Theater. Well, I'm turning to the C for my next picture, Ronnie. You probably read the story in the Saturday Evening Post. It's Reap the Wild Wind, a swashbuckling tale of wreckers on the Florida coast 100 years ago, and of a woman who wrecked a few hearts. Well, that sounds very exciting, Mr. DeMille. What about the Lux Radio Theater next week? Never a dull moment, either. Our stars will be... Carol Lombard and James Stewart. You'll hear them in The Moon's Our Home. It's a story about a screen star and an explorer who fall in love, more or less incognito. Add Carol Lombard and James Stewart to a play like that, and the sum is pure enjoyment for all of us next Monday night. Well, they're two favorites of mine, so I'll be in the audience. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Good night. And this certainly was a blue ribbon night. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theatre presents James Stewart and Carol Lombard in The Moon's Our Home. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Ronald Coleman will soon be seen in the RKO picture, My Life with Caroline. Ida Lupino's current screen success is the Warner Brothers production, High Sierra. Heard in tonight's play were Roland Drew as Frank, Dennis Green as Favelle, Verna Felton as Mrs. Van Hopper, Frederick Warlock as Colonel Julian, Hans Conried as Dr. Baker, and Lou Merrill as Coroner. The brooch offered you by the makers of Lux Flakes was designed from one worn in Gone with the Wind, the Selznick International picture produced by David O. Selznick and released by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.